Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Welcome if you're new. I hope you're having a wonderful day. In today's video, we're going to fill out form I-485, the application for adjustment of status. The current expiration date for this form is March 31st, 2023. I do have a video on the old version of this form from a year ago or so that is posted on my channel. So after watching this video, if you're still a little bit confused, you can check out the old video as well. But this is the newer version. There were some updates. So I just wanted to provide you uh, more updated information. Like I always say in my all other videos, if you are having trouble filling out certain fields in these applications while you type, your answers, you can always uh, fill in anything you couldn't type with a black uh, pen after printing out this form. So let's get started. This top part is not for us, so we can obviously leave it blank. This part is also not for us. If you're filling it out on your own, you don't have to fill this out. And here we are going to start. First and foremost, I do get a question about alien number, what to do if you don't have an alien number. Uh, so if you don't have one, you obviously don't have to fill it out at all. And if you are, for example, submitting your I-130 application online and waiting for a receipt notice to then submit your I-485 application by mail for concurrent filing, then obviously you can uh, use the A number that they assigned you on the original petition on the I-130 receipt notice and include it here. So moving on to part one. So this is information about the person applying for uh, the green card, the lawful permanent residence. Um, some people do get confused because they fill out a lot of forms at the same time. Uh, especially when you are applying concurrently. Some people do get confused and here begin writing the information about the petitioner. This is where you're filling out information about you, the person applying for lawful permanent residence. So here you want to write your current legal name uh, and it asks not to provide any nicknames. And then here, other names you have ever used since birth, if applicable. Here it says provide all other names you have ever used, including your family name at birth, other legal names, nicknames, aliases, and assumed names. So I do get a question uh, sometimes, should I be including names that I use on social media, etc.? So my perspective on this is no. Uh, try to keep as much privacy of your information as you can. However, any different spellings of your name, maiden names, other previous names, you should be including. So in our case, Jane Doe is married to John Doe, so she took his last name. However, previously, she also has been married to Jack Smith. So here, include um, her previous last name from a prior marriage and also Jane's maiden name, Ivanovsky, for example. We're including it here. And if you have more names that you have ever used, then you can use the additional information page at the very end of this application. Okay, moving on, other information, date of birth, and then here it says, in addition to providing your actual date of birth, include any other dates of birth you have used in connection with any legal names or non-legal names in the space provided. Again, at the end in the additional information page. So also keep that in mind if you have ever indicated a different date of birth um, on any documents, on anything else, then you can provide them in the last page of this application. Finally, indicate your sex, where you were born, city, town of birth, country of birth, your current country of citizenship or nationality, your alien registration number and USCIS account number. Again, if any, if you don't have these, you don't have to write them here. You can leave these blank or you can put not applicable in these spaces. It really doesn't matter. Moving on, US mailing address. So because you are applying for adjustment of status, this application can only be submitted 
by people who are currently residing in the United States. So here you should be writing your current mailing address in the United States. Alternative or safe mailing address. So this is for Violence Against Women's Act petition or any other special immigrants. If it doesn't apply to you, you can put not applicable in the space here or leave this blank. Next question is a new question compared to the old form. Uh, this question didn't exist on the old form, on the old version. So here they ask you about a social security card. So here you have an opportunity to uh, get a social security card if you wish. You can answer these questions here. And these questions are actually the same questions that you will get on the employment authorization form as well. However, if you are not planning to apply for employment authorization, for example, you can still answer these questions just so you have a social security card. If, if they have ever issued you a social security card, you can answer yes or no. If you answered yes, you must provide your social security number here. And then the next question asks, do you want the social security administration to issue you a social security card? Sometimes I do get a question if I have a social security number, but I don't have my card with me. Maybe I lost it or misplaced it. Can I answer yes uh, to receive a new card? So I personally don't know if they will issue you a new uh, card if you ask for it. And then you will also then have to answer yes to question 17 uh, so that they can use your information to issue you a new card. However, if you don't need a new card, you can just answer no. Another question I get is, can I skip these parts and just apply later if I feel like it? So um, yes, so if you answer no to these questions and you decide that you don't want a social security card, that's totally fine. And then later on you choose to obtain a social security card, a social security number, then um, you can go ahead and do that in your, on your own, in your own time. Uh, and I do have a video on my channel talking about how to obtain a social security number. However, this uh, will actually save you a lot of trouble. It will save you time. Um, you won't need to actually go to the social security office in person. Uh, so it will be a lot easier for you in general to apply for a social security number through this application uh, because they'll be able to verify your identity, et cetera, et cetera, without you having to go and do all of it on your own. Moving on, recent immigration history. So here they are asking you to provide information about your last entry to the United States using a passport or travel document. So here you want to write your passport number or if you have a tra travel document number, if you don't have one, you can leave it blank. The passport's expiration date, country of issuance, non-immigrant visa number from the passport. So I will try to put an image on the screen right now where you can find the visa number on your visa page in the passport. And then place of your last arrival, where you arrived, when you have arrived. I just want to make a note that this is asking about your most recent arrival to the United States. One question I get is, if I arrived a few years ago and I overstayed and my passport is expired, however, I renewed my passport while I was here, should I be writing my new passport number or the old one? And so the simplest way to answer is, write the information here of whatever passport you used to enter the country. So even if you have, for example, updated your passport, but you haven't used it for travel yet to the United States, then you wouldn't be writing this information here. 
Moving on, here it says, when I last arrived in the US, I, and you can answer any of these options, most likely you will answer, I was inspected at a port of entry and was admitted as, and we can say that we were a student, Jane Doe in our case was an F1 student. And here, if you have entered illegally, you can obviously answer that here. You can select these options, or if you were a, a humanitarian parole person, then you would answer this. But for the most part, you'll probably select 25A. Next item, you want to write your I-94 arrival departure record number, and you can obtain your I-94 number on the cbpdhs.gov website and i will put it on the screen right now as well please make sure that the number of your i-94 matches exactly to the number of digits that are here and also include any letters that may be in your i-94 number and then expiration date of your authorized stay so if uh, you are currently on the f1 visa your um, authorized duration of stay will not be a specific date but it would rather say d slash s which means duration of status so that means while you are maintaining your f1 status for example you're allowed to remain in the u.s with traveler visas like b visas this is a lot easier because on their i-94 it will state a specific date by which you have to leave so moving on, here you want to write the status on your form I-94, your class of admission. So class of admission basically means the type of visa that you have. So it will say something like this, F1 student, for example. Next question asks you about your current immigration status. And if you're currently under the same visa, if it hasn't expired yet, then obviously you can write the same thing. However, if you are currently out of status, then you can write out of status, for example, or you could say visa over stay, something like that. Next, you want to provide your name exactly as it appears on your I-94 form. Next, moving on to part two, here it is asking us to provide the type for your application. If you are in a family-based petition, uh, then here you will write an immediate relative of a U.S. citizen um, or whatever other family-based petition you have. So immediate relatives of U.S. citizens are spouses, children of U.S. citizens, parents of U.S. citizens. Any other relatives will be here. So a sibling of a U.S. citizen or a spouse of a uh, green card holder uh, will be listed under this category right here um, if you were on a k-1 visa so this is the box you'll select if your petitioner your u.s citizen um, has passed away then this is the one you would select and if you are um, violence against women's act self-petitioning then this is what you would select and then any employment based any special immigrants this is where you will select the type of application. One thing I do want to say is for family-based petitions, if you are filling out this application as a derivative applicant of an immediate relative of a U.S. citizen, then you would also have to select this box here. So in what cases would that apply? If, for example, you are a son or daughter of a U.S. citizen and you are unmarried, however, you have children that will be coming with you because your parent uh, cannot petition for your children, which are their grandchildren. They will be considered your derivatives and any derivative applicant of an immediate relative of a U.S. citizen will just have to select the same box right here when the time comes for them to fill out their own i-485 application and if you are confused about if you are a principal applicant or a derivative applicant 
I do suggest that you check out a video that I have on my channel explaining the difference between the two. Moving on after you select this. Uh, so here, this is another question that I get a lot of um, inquiries about. Uh, and that is, are you applying for adjustment of status based on the Immigration and Nationality Act Section 245I? So most of the people who are applying for immigration at this point will probably select no. However, you can go on the USCIS site and check out the requirements for this act and whether they apply to you. Moving on, information about your immigrant category. If you are the principal applicant, provide the following information. So um, the receipt number of underlying petition. So all this means is if you are in the family petition, for example, then this is asking for the receipt number of your I-130 petition and the priority date that was listed on that receipt. However, if you are submitting this application concurrently with your I-130 application in the same packet in the mail, you will not know what your receipt number is. If you submitted your I-130 petition online and you have already obtained your receipt notice, then you can look up that information on your I-797C receipt notice or notice of action. Moving on, if you are a derivative applicant, the spouse or unmarried child under age of 21 of the principal applicant provide the following information about the principal applicant. If you are the only person filling out this form I-485, uh, an immediate relative of a U.S. citizen or a, any other relative of a U.S. citizen uh, or a permanent resident, and you're not, you don't have any dependents, um, if you are the person for whom your I-130 petition was filed, for example, or I-140, uh, the employment-based one, then you don't need to write anything here. However, if you are the spouse or child that is accompanying the primary immigrant, the principal applicant, and you are submitting your own I-485 applications, then this is where you would include the information for the principal applicant in your case. Moving on to part three, additional information about you. Have you ever applied for an immigrant visa to obtain permanent resident status um, at a U.S. embassy or consulate overseas? So you can either say yes or no. So a uh, one interesting question that I got for this section before is that uh, what if I had an approved I-130 petition for a previous case a while ago, but I never followed through with it and I never ended up actually applying for a green card or following the next steps. Should I say yes or no? So the answer is no, because you didn't apply for an immigrant visa to obtain a permanent resident status. It was just the petition that was approved. However, if you have previously applied for the immigrant visa, uh, then here you would provide that information. And then um, here you would have to write the uh, decision that was made on your case. And you may want to also include appropriate documentation for this if this case applies to you. Okay, moving on to address history. So this is very similar to what I described in the form I-130 and the form I-130A step-by-step -step guides. But here they're asking you to provide physical address history anywhere you have ever lived over the past five years, whether inside or outside the US, and your current address should be provided first. And if you run out of space, you can use the additional information page. First, you will be writing your current address here. So this is how you can write that. And because you are adjusting your status, uh, then your current address technically should be in the United States. Moving on to physical address too. So this is where you will fill in the address where you have lived prior to this one, for example. And then 
uh, we still have a couple of years worth of address history to cover. Uh, so over the past five years would be, for example, between 2017 and 2021. So because we don't have enough space here, so we can scroll all the way down to the additional information page and here fill in the rest of the address history over the past five years, again, whether inside or outside the United States. Okay, moving on, provide your most recent address outside the United States where you've lived for more than one year, if not already listed above. So if you have already listed this in the address history for the past five years, then you don't have to repeat it. Uh, you can provide this address even if you've lived there more than five years ago, kind of like in our case. Moving on to employment history. So this is very similar to how I filled it out in the I-130 and I-130A step-by-step guides. Again, the employment history is very similar to the address history. They're asking for the last five years and uh, your most recent employment should come first. And if you're currently unemployed, then you can write unemployed and then use the additional information page to fill out the rest. So we're going to say that in our case, Jane Doe is currently unemployed and I do get asked, what do I write if I am currently a full-time student? However, I'm not making any money. Should I be writing my address of my college right here and writing that I was a student and, and that I am a student? And the answer is no. If you're not making money, if you're not actually working, then you should be writing unemployed. You can write unemployed dash student, for example, if you really wish, but you don't necessarily have to fill out this information about your college. Next, under employer two, you here would want to write your previous employment prior to this one. So prior to, for example, becoming unemployed, here you would want to write your most recent employment. And obviously don't forget the name of the employer and your occupation, uh, the address and dates between which you have worked. And then again, if you don't have enough space to provide employment history over the past five years, you can use, again, the additional information page at the very end to fill out this information. Uh, next, it's asking us to provide most recent employment outside the United States, if not already listed above. So again, uh, we're just going to say that Jane Doe has never worked outside the US. So we're just going to say not applicable and leave the rest blank. However, if you have worked outside the US, uh, then you can provide this information here. Moving on to part four, information about your parents. So this information is very similar, if not the same, as you filled out in the I-130A application, for example, if you did fill out that form before. So make sure you're including the names of your parents. Uh, if your parents' names were different at birth, this is where you can include it too their date of birth, and their sex, and where they're currently living. Next, information about parent two. Obviously, again, indicate their name, their date of birth, uh, sex, where they were born, and then where they're currently living. And I do get a question a lot, what to do if I uh, if my parent is deceased, where do I write that? So this is where you can write it in the city, town res of residence or country of residence. You can write deceased here. And also I do get another question. What do I write if I actually don't know my parent? What should I write? And in this case, you can just write unknown in this first line here under their family name. Moving on to part five, information about marital history. So you're going to write what your current marital status is. So people do sometimes make a mistake of writing married, for example, if they are widowed. 
and then they go ahead and they write the name of their current of their、uh, spouse here, even though they are widowed. So they would be writing right here the information for their spouse that they are widowed from. So、um, that that passed away. So this is not where you should be writing. This is only information if you're currently married. Then right here you would go ahead and write. Information of your current marriage.、Uh, however, if you are widowed, then you can select widowed, and then you will be including your information about that spouse that passed away on the next pages. And another mistake a lot of people make is writing divorced、uh, if they are separated with their spouse. Um, and they, or they are not actually divorced, and they are just living separately, and they're not even legally separated. So,、um, if you are not legally separated from your spouse, and or you're not actually divorced, you should be writing your current legal marital status as married. Please don't make that mistake because you will need to provide information for that.、Um, you will need to provide. Appropriate evidence for that. There are people who do get in trouble by trying to pursue immigration through marriage, and then it turns out that they actually never got divorced or separated legally from their previous spouse, and now they are no longer in touch, and they don't know where this other spouse is,、um, but they are still married, and that can get them in a lot, a lot of legal trouble. So please. Make sure that you tie up all the loose ends that you have in whatever countries you're at, especially when it comes to marriage, before pursuing immigration in the United States. So next, if you're married, is your spouse and a member of U.S. Armed Forces or Coast Guard? Answer yes or no. How many times you have been married, including annulled marriages and marriages to the same person?、Uh, we're gonna say that in our case, Jane Doe has been married twice. So currently, she's married, and then she also is divorced from Jack Smith. So here, moving on, information about your current marriage. Again, this is where you will be writing information about your current spouse, and if you, again, like I said, are a widow or a widower, you wouldn't be writing this information here. And then your current spouse's place of birth, and where the marriage took place. And this question, I want to pay your attention to: Is your current spouse applying with you? So, if your current spouse is a petitioner, then you would not be saying yes to this question. You would only answer yes to this question if your spouse was a derivative applicant. However, if your spouse is an independent applicant with his own I one thirty petition, and now they're applying for their own adjustment of status application, then you would answer no. So keep that in mind that this question is basically asking if、uh, this family member is going to be your derivative. Moving on, here you will include the information about prior marriages, whether inside or outside the United States. So we can say here you can provide information about your prior spouses, and this is again where if you are a widow or a widower, this is where you will be writing information about your deceased spouse, and here you will indicate their、uh, date of birth and date of the.、Um, Date when you married the current spouse, where the marriage took place, and date the marriage legally ended. And again, if your spouse passed away, then this date would technically be the death date for your spouse. And then again, the place where the marriage、uh, legally ended. Okay. Next, moving on to part six. This is information about your children. So here they're asking you to indicate the total number of all living children, including adult sons or daughters that you have, and the term children here includes all biological or legally adopted children, 
as well as current stepchildren of any age born inside or outside the United States, married or unmarried, living with you or elsewhere, and any missing children, any children born outside of marriage. So again, you're going to have to include them all here. So uh, in our case, Jane and John Doe don't have any kids together. However, Jane Doe has a child from her previous marriage. And again, um, there's a similar question here uh, that asks, is this child applying with you? Just like with the question on our spouse on the previous page, um, if the child is your derivative applicant, then you will be saying yes to this question. However, if the child um, has their own independent application, their own independent initial petition, as well as independent adjustment of status application, then in this case, you're going to say no. Moving on, any other children? Moving on to part seven. So this is biographic information. Answer these questions about your ethnicity, race, weight, height, eye color, hair color, this will be useful information for when you go to your biometrics appointment. Moving on to part eight, general eligibility and inadmissibility grounds. So here there will be a lot, a lot of questions that you will have to answer truthfully. The first part of the section refers to you being a member of any organizations or associations, any clubs, societies, etc., etc., so you could say yes or no. Um, so in my previous guide, I'm pretty sure I included being part of organizations like an honor society in college, or if you're a member of a church, for example, you can also include that here. Okay, moving on to the section right here. Uh, so item numbers 14 to 80. So that is a lot of different questions. You will either either have to answer yes or no to any of these questions. And then if there is any uh, questions that you want to provide an explanation for, then you can use the additional information page again. And you can refer to my guide a video guide to specifically how to use the additional information page and I do give an example of how to explain information that you answer to any of these questions. And please make sure that you're not answering any questions that do not apply to you, such as this one, for example, question 24B and 24C. I frequently see people just going down the list and just clicking no, 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 no to all of these questions and not paying attention. So this question, 24B and C, only applies to you if you have answered uh, yes to question 24a and that is have you ever been a j non-immigrant exchange visitor who was subject to two-year foreign residence requirement so if you have been a j non-immigrant visitor and you have been a subject to two-year foreign residence requirement you'll either have to answer obviously yes and then continue to questions 24b and c however if you've never been a j non-immigrant you must answer no to this question and skip questions 24b and c moving on so obviously go through all of these questions and answer yes or no so this is a lot of different questions asking you if you have ever committed crimes felonies any offenses um, and are you planning to engage in any of that so uh, go ahead and read through these and answer them very carefully. And in your green card interview, the USCIS officer will also go through every single question and have you answer yes or no and pledge that the information that you are stating is true and correct. Finally, we got to the very end to part nine after answering all those questions. And here they're asking if you require any accommodations, if you have a disability. And then part 10 is your statement, contact information, signature, etc. So here you will need to select if you either want a 
can read and understand English and filled out everything on your own and understood every question and instruction. So here you select this box. If you used an interpreter who helped read and translate the questions to you, you can select the box 1B. If somebody filled out this form for you, you would need to select uh, this box under item 2. But again, the preparer should honestly be the one that fills out this box right here. Include your phone number, email address, and right here on the next page, sign this form. If you used an interpreter, then you can write their information here. If you didn't, then you can put not applicable or leave this blank. Same applies to right here for the preparer. So if you didn't use a preparer, you can also leave this blank. If you are a parent of an underage person filling out the information for their child, then you can put yourself down as a preparer. On part 13, please make sure that you do not sign anything here. Leave this blank because this is where you will provide a signature at your green card interview. So this will be filled out and the USCIS officer will guide you through this part. So at the time of you filling out this form, you shouldn't be touching the section at all. And finally, we got to the end of our application, the additional information page. We used this page to provide any information that didn't fit in this application. So I know this form was very long. Please give this video a like so more people can see it. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. I wish you luck in the immigration process and I hope to see you in my next videos.